This episode of CPP Cast is sponsored by Incredibuild. Accelerate your C++ build by up to 30 times faster directly from within Visual Studio 2017. Just make sure to check the Incredible box in the C++ workload VS 2017 setup. And by JetBrains, maker of intelligent development tools to simplify your challenging tasks and automate the routine ones. JetBrains is offering a 25% discount for an individual license on the C++ tool of your choice, C-Lion, ReSharp, or C++, or AppCode. Use the coupon code JetBrains for CPPCast during checkout at JetBrains.com. CPPCast is also sponsored by Pacific++, the first major C++ conference in the Pacific region, providing great talks and opportunities for networking. Get your ticket now during early bird registration until June 1st. Episode 97 of CPPCast with guest Akeem Damal, recorded April 12th, 2017. In this episode, we discuss some big conference announcements. Then we talk to Akeem Damal, professor at APIDA. Akeem talks to us about VCSN, a platform for automata and rational expressions. Welcome to episode 97 of CPP Cast, the only podcast for C++ developers by C++ developers. I'm your host, Rob Irving, joined by my co-host, Jason Turner. Jason, how are you doing today? Good. Sleepy. Sleepy. Good. That's Yeah, good. we'll see if I stay awake through the episode. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we've lost you to, to uh, passing out once yet, so I think you'll be okay. <laughs> that, that's true. That hasn't happened yet. Yeah. So I just got a new laptop. Uh, I finally installed Visual Studio 2017, so that's nice. I, I've and been with waiting the new ins- I was expecting to get the, the new laptop soon. And 2017 is supposed to install like 10 times faster than 2015, right? Yeah, I and I installed both 2013 and 2017 because I still might need 2013 to build some things. Um, and, and you could notice pretty clearly the, the difference in install time between the two. It was cool. Nice. I will. Have to do that when I get my new laptop soon also. Very cool. Okay. Well, at the top of our episode, I'd like to read a piece of feedback. Uh, this week, we got an email from Mandar, and he wrote, You guys have been doing really great work, and my 40-minute drive to office and on the way back has been a learning ride ever since. Uh, I'm from Prune, India, and I'm a C++ developer like many others. I call myself as born and brought up with CPP because I started my career 10 years ago as a C++ programmer, and I believe my programming sense has grown slowly and steadily ever since then, just like the C++ standards. Uh, Also, congratulations for grabbing the best overall podcast. You guys really deserve it. Uh, Thank you. We appreciate it. Uh, He has a suggestion about a topic. Could you discuss pros and cons of static initialization in C++? It's pros and cons in one of your episodes. In my previous organization, the product which I worked on suffered from a large startup time, and one of the culprits was huge usage of static initialization. My learning was, although the concept is very powerful, it needs to be judiciously used, but overall I find the concept interesting to explore more and know about. Jason, this sounds like something you may have already talked about in a C++ Weekly. Um, I do correct? have some... Yeah, I, I did one episode on the cost of using statics, but more just in general, I hate globals. Yeah. So I would it would be a highly opinionated episode if we <laughs> talked about that. <laughs> well, might be a good one, though. We'll have to think about that once more. See who we would get on. Yeah. So we'd love to hear your thoughts about the show as well. You can always reach out to us on Facebook, Twitter, or email us at feedback at cpcast.com. And don't forget to leave us your review on iTunes. Joining us today is Akeem Damal. Akeem has been participating in free software for about 20 years, starting with A2PS and anything to PostScript tool written in C. In order to ensure its portability, he became a major contributor to new AutoConf, new AutoMake, and new Bison. Akeem has been teaching and researching at APIDA, a French CS graduate school, for 18 years. He has taught formal languages, logics, object-oriented design, C++, and compiler constructions, which includes the Tiger compiler, an educational 
final project where students implement a compiler in C++. This project, whose assignment is regularly updated, keeps track of the C++ evolution, and this year's version uses C++ 17 features. Akeem's recent research interests are focused on the VCSN platform dedicated to automata and rational expressions, and he's recently been recruited by former students of his to be part of the Infinite team at Docker. Akeem, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I um, I got to ask about your contributions to AutoConf, AutoMake, and Bison to ensure portability, because those are kind of notoriously difficult to use tools on Windows specifically. Yeah, but it was something like 20 years ago, and I was mainly interested in all the different kind of Unixes that existed then. So it's more uh, about yeah. Solaris and uh, the young Linux at that time, and many different Unixes. That was my main focus. That would have been a very interesting time to be working on um, helping make sure auto foo tools are working on the brand new Linux. Yeah, uh, that's we we call it auto tools. If you want to to name the the, the, the new build system, live tool, okay. and other conf. Yeah, it was an exciting time. Huh. Okay, uh, so we're going to have a couple news articles to discuss, Akeem, and then we'll talk more about your most recent project uh, with VCSN, okay? Sure. Okay, so first one, we have a couple conference announcements. Um, announcing Meeting C++ 2017. Uh, it's going to be three days now, uh, November 9th to 11th in Berlin, just like the previous uh, years of the conference. And one of the exciting things I thought here was they announced the keynoters, uh, at least some of them, uh, Sean Parent, uh, Kate Gregory, and Max Musterman. Um, I'm not familiar with Max Musterman, but uh, it's great to see Kate Gregory will be keynoting the conference. Um, I, I'm actually friends with Kate on Facebook, and I think she made a recent announcement that she actually has been having some health problems over the past year, and that's why we didn't see her at CppCon, but she's feeling better now. And she's going to be back on the conference circuit, which is great to see. Yeah, that's the yeah. It's and you catch this Max Musterman? You know who that is? I, I do not. And what about John Doe? <laughs> well, I'm guessing John Doe is a placeholder. Yeah, I suppose. Well, yes, it's like go ahead. the German version of a placeholder. Correct? Oh, okay, okay. I was not aware of that. Okay, so they're they're waiting to announce this third keynote then. And it's great to see women uh, in keynotes. Oh yeah, absolutely. Anything yeah, else Kate's you want to a friend of the out? podcast. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, and then another conference announcement: C plus plus now um, are announcing their second keynoter, and this one will be Ali Cirilli. Uh, hopefully, I'm pronouncing that right. And that's uh, right. Pro programming in D. So he is the author of uh, of Competitive Advantage with D. Is, is that the name of the book? I uh, know he's the author of Programming in Programming D. Programming in D. Okay. Yeah. Competitive and the talk of it, the title of his talk, right? Competitive Advantage. And he also sits on the D Foundation. So, Jason, you you've attended C plus plus now a couple times. Um, how do you think the conference is going to respond to these D and and Rust uh, developers giving keynotes? I think it's going to be a lot of fun because the people who tend to attend C++ now are people that are stretching the language to their limits and want to know what's possible in other languages and wants to know like where the language should be evolving to. Right. So I think it makes a lot of sense for C++ now. Maybe not for one of the larger, more mainstream conferences, but... Yeah, maybe this won't go over quite as well as CppCon. Maybe not, but... Yeah. Yeah, I was listening to um, to CPP chat uh, last week, and uh, Bryce Lelbach and John Call, of course, were on that, and they're uh, both involved with both conferences. And, and they made a comment. They didn't announce um, uh, Ali doing the keynote then, but they kind of hinted at it. And they said that you know they've looked at feedback from from previous conferences, and that the more Controversial topics seem to be more favored by the audience, so they're specifically trying to go for controversial topics or potentially controversial topics because they think the audience will like it. So this definitely seems like it, you know, should be popular. Yeah. Have you uh, been to either of these conferences, Akeem? No, unfortunately not. Okay. 
Okay. Uh, so the next one, uh, this is on Latix's blog, and it's reduce C++ build times by reducing header dependencies. And this is something that I'm guessing a lot of our listeners ha- have heard of, that you know, if you can reduce the number of headers in your source files, you should be able to reduce build times, especially if the header files are unnecessary. But it's kind of worth reminding listeners that uh, you should be looking out for this. And uh, when I looked at Reddit, there were some comments pointing out some other tools that you could use to uh, to look for unused headers. Like um, I think it's Clang's uh, use what only use what you use. Include what you uh, use. Include what you use. Yeah. Yeah, it's useful. I actually had a problem with this article. What was that? <laughs> And his final example here, he Ford declares um, share price okay. uh, so that he doesn't have to include an extra header. Sure. And then in his in the class stock, share price now becomes a pointer. Right. And he doesn't. Um, it's not wrapped in a smart pointer. Right. And he does not add a destructor. Hmm. So we've taken what was very simple, easy to reason about code that could all work nicely with the stack and converted it into something with a memory leak. Right. Yeah. Essentially. Yeah, definitely could, uh, could do much better with that example. It's kind of a very weak pimple. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> pimple. Hmm. Okay, and then the last article, this is a really short one, uh, capturing the this pointer in C++ 11, 14, and 17. And this is showing examples on how you can capture this in a Lambda in the three different versions of uh, modern C++. And I, I want to know what you guys think about this, but I kind of feel like C++ 14's version looks really nice, and then C++ 17 looks kind of confusing. Well, I, actually, the 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 most value of this uh, this blog post is about the the report itself, where you can read why they decided to add that feature, and mainly it's to avoid forgetting uh, if you if you do not well if you capture with self as you did, you need to use mm-hmm. self everywhere, and maybe you forgot one or two places, in which case you would be using the captured pointer this. So the, the main idea is, may, is to make sure that you don't forget some occurrences of this. So you say once for all, I want this to be a copy. Okay. So in the C++17 version, you, you're specifically prevented from using this. It would be a compile yes. error? Yes. Okay. Mm. Interesting. Now, I, I've, I like abusing lambdas, but I've yet to come up with an actual use case where capturing this by, by copy, by value is useful like i don't i just don't know where this is used by people have either of you used this never as i don't think so okay (laughs) someone must be using it or else there wouldn't be proposals to uh keep changing the way it's used right sure yeah i I guess if you got some go ahead well i i was just uh thinking that it's another sign that this being a pointer is kind of weird it's an historical artifact. It should have been a reference, but references were invented after this. But it's, there's kind of an inconsistency in the way you have to treat this because it's a pointer. That's an interesting point. And yeah, right, because it's not, um, this can never be null, right, according sure. to the standard. So it would make the most sense for it to be a reference. Yeah, and it probably would have been a reference if references were invented before, but uh, it, it went the other way around. That's interesting. I hadn't ever thought about that. Okay, well, Akeem, uh, maybe you can start us off by telling us a little bit about the VCSN project that we, was mentioned in your bio. Yeah, okay. So VCSN is a, is a platform for automata and rational expressions. First, I should say that what I call rational expressions is what most people would call regex, regular expressions. Regular or rational is about the same. Um, it's a platform in the sense that it's first a C++ library and tools around it, or rather on top of it. Uh, there are bindings to Python, for instance, and binding to IPython, 
which is a, a kind of a GUI, uh, a very nice terminal with uh, graphical possibilities, and also tools to use it from the shell, using pipes and everything in the in the usual uh, uh, Unix way. So it's about automata. Automata is our uh, oriented graphs. Well, I guess most computer scientists know what automata are, but what's specific about VCSN is that it targets many different kinds of automata. So usually automata are labeled with letters, right? So mm -hmm. you, you follow the transitions and the transitions are labeled with letters, but actually you could decide that you want to label the transitions with uh, words instead of letters, and maybe tuples of letters or tuples mixing some input, which would be a letter and some output, which could be a word, etc. Besides, uh, automata can be weighted, which means that usually automata just say yes or no. They are just computing some Boolean function. Uh, the word is accepted or the word is rejected, like grep does. But you can also decide to uh, to compute some score. So, for instance, it's used by linguists, by uh, computational linguistics, to uh, to make to to implement translation, automatic translation, and this kind of things where they look for the closest possible uh, result, the most likely result. I mean, okay. 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 So, since you could have many different kind of labels and many different kind of weights, uh, VCSN as a library is heavily templated. It's templated by the type of uh, labels you can use and the type of weights you can use, which poses quite many problems when you want to bind it to uh, uh, to uh, an environment that would be nice for students to discover what automata are. So actually what I wanted to discuss with, with you about uh, VCSN is what we do to be able to, to bridge the gap between C++ templated library and Python on top of it. Okay, so what uh, tools do you use for that or how, how do you accomplish that? Um, there are several tools and the, the, the one we use to go from C++ to Python is Boost Python. Okay. I know you've been using Swig, but I have been using Swig too, and I remember a uh, very, very bad time, horrible headaches, and <laughs> I guess most recent of, uh, versions of Swig are easier to use, but, um, well, I was burned by it, and I did not want to try again. Uh, on a sufficiently large project, Swig can be a beast to use, but... If you need to expose to many different languages, then it can be helpful. Yeah, probably the best answer. Yeah, I agree. So you're using Boost Python, but then how do you solve the problem of exposing these templates S to Python? I don't. Uh, okay. What we actually do is that we have uh, another C++ layer on top of the bottom uh, library. The bottom library is uh, C++ is templated, and on top of it, we have uh, uh, another API we call DIN for dynamic, which implement types erasure. So we have, for instance, many different types of automata, uh, not only many different instances of the class uh, automata, but uh, automaton, but also many different classes implementing automata. And using type erasure, we declare uh, a DIN automata, which is a regular type. It's not templated. Okay. Am I clear? I, th I believe so. So maybe to take just a quick step back for our, our listeners, the problem is a template is not a concrete thing, so it cannot be exposed to the scripting engine. Right. So you have to provide it something concrete that you can actually provide, uh, expose to Python. Exactly. You have to instantiate it, and you want to, to put it in a box. You want to wrap it in something that you expose. And so you are basically creating some sort of, like, I don't know, is it equivalent to, like, uh, C++17's any type or something? Well, uh, well you, you, you could call it that way, but it's typed 
any. It's really meant for uh, automata, and yeah, it, it, it uses the same kind of techniques, which is just type erasure, indeed. Okay. So Dyn is giving you a way of basically converting from compile time type erasure to runtime type erasure. Right. Okay. So is this a library that could be used outside of Automata, or does it provide some sort of generic capability that the rest of us could take advantage of? No, I guess there are some IDs to pick from there, but it was not implemented in the ID to be used in another project than VCSN. Okay. I wanted to interrupt this discussion for just a moment to bring you a word from our sponsors. Incredibuild dramatically reduces compilation and development times with unique process virtualization technology. The tech transforms your computer network into a virtual supercomputer and lets each workstation use hundreds of vital cores across the network. Use Incredibuild to accelerate much more than just C++ compilations. Speed up your unit tests, run more development cycles, and scale your development to the cloud to unleash unreal speeds. Join more than 100,000 users to save hundreds of monthly developer hours using existing hardware. Incredibuild is already integrated into Visual Studio 2017. Just make sure to check the Incredibuild box in the C++ workload in the Visual Studio 2017 setup. When you first uh, reached out to us, you, you mentioned IPython and, and Jupyter. Can you tell us a little bit about those and how they're used with VCSN? Mm, sure. So once you have a binding to Python, it's quite easy to, to use IPython, which is just another, uh, another interpreter, another top-level loop for Python. And in particular, you can run it from a web browser, in which case you could, you, you could use Anything a web browser can uh, can display. So, for instance, when you uh, when you have an automaton, it's displayed as an as an automaton. It's really you can see the graph and understand how it works. And when you have, for instance, a mathematical formula, it's nicely displayed displayed as it would be with uh, LaTeX, for instance. So it's a completely a, a much nicer way to uh, interact with Python. It's kind of Mathematica or Maple for Python. And since the, the project was very successful, they decided to extend it to many other languages. That's why it's been mm. renamed uh, Jupyter, which uh, stands for Julia, Python, and R. But okay, now okay. there are many more languages supported. I think I saw there was some version of C++ binding for it also via Kling or something. Maybe. Okay. So once you wrap your automata, and the, the most interesting part is really when you want to call functions. And uh, what's particular about this way of, uh, the way we chose to uh, type your A's is that you can take your DIN automaton and ask it, what is your exact type? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. And then you can use, for instance, if you want to uh, apply an operation on uh, on two automata, you can query those two automata to know uh, those two automata to know what their type are, and then to select the routine that correspond exactly to their uh, to their types. So you have a dynamic dispatch hidden um, behind the automaton that will select a specific templated algorithm in the lowest uh, library based on this type signature, dynamic type signature. Okay, that makes sense. Um, so what are the uh, challenges that you hit working on this approach? Uh, well, uh, it was very incremental, so there was no single uh, big wall to climb, but uh, mainly to get some kind of um, uh, some kind of introspection to be able to query an object and get something that describes its type. Mm -hmm. uh, cannot use type ID because the name is not uh, the 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 convention into a name is not really standard, and it was in, not convenient for us to use it as as a key. But roughly. We need to uh, implement some kind of small, just what we need, some small introspection. That's just type traits. 
And, uh, 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 well, that's about it for that part. <laughs> okay. So, uh, so, oh, and I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, just to conclude about the, the, what you can do when you call a function this way is that in practice that provides you with multi-methods. So really it's the dispatch depends on the type of all the arguments to select the exact routine that you will be running. Do you uh, have to deal with the potential for ambiguous overloads or ambiguous calls with your dynamic dispatch? Uh, it cannot happen. Uh, it's always, you get the exact type of all, all your arguments, and either there is a single function that corresponds to it, or there's no implementation, but there cannot be many. Okay. So I'm curious, what do you do if no implementation matches? That's an interesting question. If the, if there's no answer, uh, since we get a precise descriptions of the arguments that we were uh, using, we can generate just a bit of C++ that instantiates the routine you were calling with the exact types. So it's just a template instantiation. It's just a short file that instantiates the function you were about to call. Okay. That same file just adds a hook to register that function when it's ready. S then, mm -hmm. then it's compiled into a shared object. Then we DL open the shared object. The hook inside the shared object register the function you just compiled into the system. And so the, the call you attempt paused for the time it took to compile the, or your uh, your routine, and proceeds with uh, proceed by calling it. Wow. Okay. So you can actually. Uh, I'm sorry if I understood that correctly. You can actually compile the function if it doesn't already exist. Right. Well, I, actually, I should say that you can instantiate the function you know, for the arguments you just uh, you just gave. Okay. All right. So when the system first starts up. Do you have, I don't know, maybe, yeah. in my head, I'm imagining you just, there's no reason to give it anything. You just start it up with an empty plate and let it fill in what it needs as you use it. Yes, you could do that, but it's not very nice because it has to compile many things at the beginning. And when you start the system, you want it to be already responsive for the most typical cases. So there are a couple of typical routines and typical arguments that you want to use that are pre-compiled. And then the system will complete itself uh, on on the go while you use it. And of course, we're caching everything. So if you quit and restart the system, you won't be recompiling everything. We just check that the timestamp are up to date, and if nothing changed, we just reload the shared object. Wow, it's pretty impressive. It's it was really made because we. Uh, VCSN was made for researchers to be able to implement algorithm on automata. It was also made for a linguist to use it, so it needs to be ready to work on automata with millions of states, hence C++. But we also wanted it to be usable by students who were just discovering the field. So we really wanted to provide something easy to use and an environment such as IPython or Python is really what we wanted. So there was no option. We really wanted to be able to hide the templated uh, library behind something much simpler. But still be able to provide all the speed of the compile time. Exactly. So if you use, uh, if you really want to use the, the the library, the bottom library, everything is just at excellent speed. You cannot, you, you don't lose anything. If you're on top of DIN, you don't lose much because usually when you call an algorithm on automata, it's quite ex the algorithm itself is expensive. So the cost of the dispatch is you forget about it. The dispatch itself was measured. It's about forty times, fifty times what uh, uh, virtual would cost. Okay. So it's much more expensive, but since you do it on the, uh, on uh, com um, expensive computations, it's you forget about it. So could you see this? Like, okay, so 
as I'm envisioning this, I'm thinking it, it seems like it's like like the the meshing of like some of the work I've done with Chai Script with like the dynamic recompilation stuff that the game developers are talking about that we've had on the show before. Is that Doug? I think. Um, I think so. Uh, so I'm I'm thinking like if you were to you know hypothetically throw away Python. Could you envision putting your own scripting layer on top of this or Lua or something else and and make it like into the perfect game scripting engine? Uh, I, I guess you could. I, actually, uh, really, Python is just one, one API that we provide on top of it, but all the magic is really done in C++. The, the generation of, uh, of code, the loading of code, type erasure, everything is done in C++. So actually, DIN would be very easy to, to bind using SWIG, and you could easily target many other languages. SWIG wouldn't know about the fact that it's in, uh, below its instantiating code and compiling code. It's really cool. Yeah. yeah, it is. And yes, I, I, I agree that there are probably many things that are similar to what you've been doing in TriScript in there. Uh, well, I mean, I was when you started talking about dynamic dispatch, I'm like, well, I could ask a thousand questions about how you implemented different things, but we don't necessarily need to go down that road. But uh, so, so what compilers do you work with then? Uh, well, Clang and GCC. I never okay. tried to port it to uh, to Windows, and I don't know if there are users of uh, of VCSN on Windows. So you right. just haven't tried yet? No, I never tried. I'm not okay. running Windows, so. and I, I am aware <laughs> that now you can run Visual on uh, on Unix, but never tried it though. Yeah, you could compile on Unix. Um. But uh, Jupyter itself works on Windows, Linux, Mac uh, OS. Is that correct? Yes, yeah, you know? certainly. I don't know. I never tried, but I don't see why it wouldn't. Mm. Okay. The project is open source, right? So other contributors could try it on other platforms if they wanted to. Sure. And actually, since the since there's a, a web uh, a web backend, since you can use it from a web browser, then it's also usable from from your home. Just go to vcsn sandbox dot lrde dot apita dot fr, uh, and then you can use it. You can try it without having to install anything. So we can put a link to that in the show notes. Sure. Yes, absolutely. So okay, so maybe if we can go back to like the actual tool that you've written uh, from the uh, Jupiter perspective, you can just like what type in a regular expression, and this will show you a graph of it. Right. You can compile your rational expression into an automaton, and there are many different ways to transform a to compute an automaton from a rational expression. So you can try the different algorithm and see what it produce, what they produce. And rational expressions are, or regular expressions are more powerful than what usually you can see. So for instance, you could, um, it works very well with, uh, complement when you want to say, I don't want that, uh, I don't want to match that. And it, uh, it supports very well also intersection. So I want this and this. And there are many operators. You could say, I want this and this, but I don't know in which order. So regex, the usual regex is quite poor compared to what you could actually do with automata. Okay. And uh, go ahead, Rob. I was going to ask, so you said that uh, this is already being used by, you know, the research community and by some of your students. Yeah, it's used by, it's used when uh, we, we teach uh, automata theory. Okay. So outside of language and regular expressions, I have to admit my knowledge or at least my recent experience with automata is very low. So how, how else – can you give us more examples of what automata are, can be modeled with your system? Or is regular expressions like the superset of these things? 
Uh, oh, no, no. Uh, actually, a uh, regular expression is just one way to define automata, and it's very compact when you know what you want to express, but automata can be used to represent very, very large languages. So, in which case, ra rational expressions are really not the way to, to build them. So you could easily build automata using dictionaries, or you can build automata with uh, machine learning techniques, in mm -hmm. which case you get absolutely huge automata that you cannot really browse. And if you were to extract a rational expression from it, there's no chance you would understand anything from it. So <laughs> rational expressions are really nice when it's when you know what you want for requests, for queries, it's really nice. But to represent a large set of uh, knowledge, uh, it's not the right tool. So going back to what you were talking about at the beginning of the interview, a machine, a machine learning system might analyze whatever and generate automata for you that could then be used in translation, you were saying, essentially. Yes, absolutely. That's one of the techniques huh. which is used for uh, uh, automated translation. That's something I have absolutely no experience with at all. Okay, is there anything else um, that we're missing that we haven't talked about yet with uh, VCSN or the Python bindings? Well, actually, I don't know. It depends how deep in the details you want to, <laughs> to go. So, for instance, we, we did not discuss how you can... Uh, Traverse, uh, you can go through uh, dynamic API down to the static API. So you um, you need a system to be to unwrap your boxes to get the the object. So really, for instance, if you if you evoke invoke a dynamic routine, you have to unwrap your dynamic arguments to get the static arguments, and this needs a cast. Mm -hmm. Then you invoke the function from the static library. Then you get a static result, which you wrap into a dynamic result. And all this needs to be done for every single uh, every every single algorithm you implement. And in the end, spotting everything is kind of uh, boring. So much of it can be automated by just looking at the, the signature of the dynamic algorithm that you want to expose. And what we use, we, we parse this kind of uh, simple C++ signature and generate quite, quite a lot of code out of it that uh, <laughs> does the unpacking, calling, and packing, and returning. All with uh, lots of template tomato programming, I assume? Yes, there is, yes. Uh, how long have you been working on this project? Uh, something like four years, four or five years, I guess. Okay, so you were able to start with having variadic templates available yes, to you. Yes, and that was absolutely <laughs> critical to have it. Yeah, variadic templates were really uh, a godsend for the implementation. And that, just to, to conclude on what you, you can do when you, uh, when you master the dynamic dispatch, um, so as I said, sometimes your automata can, for instance, have several, uh, several tapes, what we call tape. You could have a, a tape on which the automaton is reading and a tape on which the automaton is writing. Okay, so it's uh, usual automata has a single tape, you can have many. And the tapes do not need to have the, the same type. So for instance, my input tape could be just labels or letters and the output tape could have strings, okay? Okay. And you might want to project or have a view of your automaton on just one of the two tapes, in which case from the C++ uh, library, it's two different, uh, it's two different instantiation that depend on an int, the template, uh, uses a static integer to select the tape that you want to uh, show. Okay. Okay. But from the Python uh, side, you pass a regular integer. So we are also able to convert a dynamic integer, 0, 1, 2, into a static, uh, static integer that we give to the template system. 
Okay, how do you do that? So, <laughs> the way we do that is by uh, using uh, the, the... So, the dynamic dispatch uses signatures. Okay, so when you get uh, an object, you ask, it, you ask it, what is your static type? And what we do then is when we see an integer that goes uh, into a place where a static integer is expected, mm -hmm. instead of saying this is an integer, we say this is a std integral constant, and we pass the value of the dynamic integer into there. But don't forget that we generate code, so we just print, actually, we just print the value of that integer into the uh, C++ code at the place where the std uh, integral uh, constant is expected. Then you compile, you load, and it works. Okay. So a function is requested at runtime. Right. You don't yet have a version of this function. Mm -hmm. So you actually generate C++ code, like a CVP file, and compile that. Uh, again, uh, I'm not exactly generating the function. I'm generating the instantiation of the function. The right. function exists, right. but it's mm -hmm. the, uh, the, the parameters that are computed and printed, and it's the instantiated uh, function that we compile and load. Okay. I think that, yeah, the, the piece that I was missing, and maybe if you can correct me if I'm wrong, is the fact that you are actually generating a C++ file that needs to be passed to the compiler that has these instantiations that you're looking for. Exactly. That's what we do. All right. That makes sense. <laughs> and uh, I, I would have never thought of going around that route, but I love it. <laughs> Good. So maybe I have one more contributor. <laughs> We'll see. It seems like the kind of thing Clemens Morgenstern might be interested in also, since he works on the dynamic loading libraries for Boost. Hmm. I don't know. I, it's Anyhow. <laughs> so you had a lot of stuff going on in your bio. Maybe we could touch on some of these other topics. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about the Tiger compiler that your graduate students work on? So the the Tiger compiler is uh, is a project at Epita, and uh, it was really designed for them to to have a long term project, which was mm, uh, which was tricky, not mm -hmm. a simple project, and something that would uh, that would uh, that would run for several months, because students are often um, making projects, what we call clinics projects. You know, you just write the project and you throw it away. <laughs> <laughs> and they take bad habits from this. They don't write uh, tests or not, main, right. and not not enough tests, not enough documentation. The code is not readable. And, and it, it, so we really wanted to find something that would last for several months so that the students would understand the pain of not maintaining the test suite, not right. maintaining the comments, not maintaining the code and everything. And a compiler is very nice for this because it's a very, it's just a pipe. It's a sequence of modules. So uh, the way we uh, design the Tiger compiler is they have to, uh, first they write the parser and then they write the, the binder which checks uh, just checks what are the names that are introduced and what are the names that are used, and then the type checker and so forth. So it's a project on uh, over several months, and they have to write it in C++. So each module tries to bring something new about C++ to discover in its implementation. Okay. okay. Uh, do you target LLVM <coughs> or have the students use LLVM, that is? Yes and no. So there are several backends, and recently some of the students have implemented a backend for LLVM, but the the the, the main backend that we uh, proposed them is to implement it by themselves by hand, okay. not using okay. any any library. That'd be a very interesting project to work on. Yeah. And. Um, you also mentioned that you recently joined Infinite, uh, and some of your, and that, which is a part of Docker, and that some of your students, uh, apparently work there. You want to tell us a little right. bit about what you're doing with Docker? 
So Infinite uh, is working on the distributed file system. So Docker is really okay. about uh, containers, and containers um, roughly are very lightweight virtual machines. It's not virtual machines. It's different, but if... I, I'm not sure I have enough time to describe the, what exactly containers are. Sure. But containers, the idea is really to be able to spawn many, many containers, many virtual machines, and maybe lose them and maybe uh, put more, being able to be elastic. It's really designed for the cloud. So you can spawn new machines, kill machines, etc. You don't care about these machines. It's really cattle. The problem, of course, is that usually if you have several machines, they are computing something useful and you want to keep it. So that's where Infinite uh, is used. Infinite is a distributed file system, and that's where we put the data that you want to to, to last. Okay. That's yeah, I'm sure we've talked storage. about it. I'm sorry? Uh, Infinite provides the persistent storage. Okay. Yeah, I'm sure we've talked a little bit about Docker in, in the past on the show. It's sure I'm sure it's something that at least most of our listeners are familiar with. Hmm. Yeah. yeah, most probably. Okay, well, is there anything else uh, you wanted to go over before we let you go? It's been great having you on today, Akeem. Thank you very much. Well, I don't know. If you have questions, just call me back. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, and um, we'll put links in the show notes, but where can people find VCSN or, or find you online? Uh, well, the easiest is to go to VCSN's homepage, which will be in the show notes. So, okay. The easiest to reach me is to go to cppcast.com. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, do you have any papers or anything that you've written uh, documentation for how the Dyn system works? And yes, how you're there's a tech report, so uh, I will provide it also for the for the show notes if you want more gory details, or maybe someday I could have a visit, a guided visit into uh, into the code. I don't know how to do a virtual guided visit in code, but that would be something to experiment. Yeah, yeah it could be interesting. Yeah. The screencast, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Well, it's been great having you on. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening in as we chat about C++. I'd love to hear what you think of the podcast. Please let me know if we're discussing the stuff you're interested in. Or if you have a suggestion for a topic, I'd love to hear about that too. You can email all your thoughts to feedback at cppcast.com. I'd also appreciate if you like cppcast on Facebook and follow cppcast on Twitter. You can also follow me at Rob W. Irving and Jason at LeftKiss on Twitter. And of course, you can find all that info and the show notes on the podcast website at cppcast.com. Theme music for this episode is provided by podcastthemes.com. Theme music for this episode is provided by podcastthemes.com.